The following is a Boston's WB special presentation. For over 100 years, New England has been witness to a tradition so unique to our culture. From its infancy on Pearl Street in Worcester, where pin boys and hardwood set the table, to today's high-tech world of pin setters and rock and roll, candle pin bowling has endured. Tonight, this lost treasure returns to television. Let the tradition continue. The tradition that is candle pin bowling. Hi everyone, I'm Frank Malakota. Welcome to Haverhill Mass here at Pilgrim Lanes. For the next 30 minutes, we're going to take an in-depth look at a sport that is truly a New England tradition, and that of course is candle pin bowling. I got to tell you too, folks, all of us at Boston's WB are thrilled to bring candle pins back to Boston television. And it all kicks off this weekend, Saturday, 6 o'clock. We hope you tune in for our very first show. It is Candle Pins for Dollars. My broadcast partner and a guy that's done this many times before and a pretty fair candle pinner himself, Mike Moore. Mike, I know you're excited. Very excited, especially to be here at Pilgrim Lanes. So much history over the last 40 years, a lot of great bowlers, big scores, and I'm sure we'll see a lot on our show here in the next several years. You, Frank, have been out looking at a lot of bowling centers, meeting a lot of the fans, a lot of the bowlers, and you can tell they are ravenous for this show. They want us to get started. Oh, there's no doubt about it. There is a buzz in the air. Thanks, Mike. You know, candle pin bowling has been a tradition here in New England for over a century. Families in the region have grown up throwing this small ball, but where did it start and when? Two good questions. And with all the answers, here's Jamie Keneally now with more on the Grand Old Game. The rich history of candle pit bowling goes back further than most think. In fact, evidence found in Egyptian tombs suggests that some 7,000 years ago, a similar game was played by ancient pharaohs. In the late 1500s, the great English Admiral Sir Francis Drake played a game called Skittles even while the Spanish Armada approached the English Channel. The Pilgrims in Plymouth, well, they played a game called Bowls where small balls were rolled at small pins. However, it was not until the late 1870s that a man named Justin White began the craze of candle pin bowling. Bob Perella, an authority on the game, talks about its origin. Candle pin bowling, first of all, was invented in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, in, in about 1878, uh, Justin White got together with some people and they tried to develop a different form of bowling, something that wasn't as strenuous uh, as 10 pin. Small balls and broomsticks were the order in White's Billiards and Bowling Center on Pearl Street in Worcester. Then, in 1888, White teamed up with Jack Monzi, who introduced New England to what is now a New England institution. And Jack Monzi is considered the father of modern day candle pins because we still use his specifications today. We're using a, a four and a half inch candle pin ball, and we use, this by the way, is a pin from his actual collection. Not a lot has changed since except Monzi's original wood giving way to today's plastic pins and pin boys who helped set the table have since been replaced by mechanical pin setters. Candle pin bowling, a thriving sport, did have its moments of peril, however. In fact, in the late 50s, early 60s, the 10 pin industry made a big push in New England with the full intent to crush the game. They needed to put candle pins out by bringing in 10 pin, and they did it in a the flurry. They brought in a lot of bowling centers, they invested in a lot of bowling centers across New England, but the sheer magnitude of the attractiveness of the candle pin bowling, the fun, the excitement, the challenge, they couldn't put it up. Through the years, some of the game's greats have helped shape its future from the likes of Amesbury's Tony Baldinelli, a four-time world singles champion, to the grand dom of candle pins, Stacia Zernike of Webster, Massachusetts, who dominated the sport for over 40 years. She were ahead of her time as far as uh, females being involved in sports, competing with men. She could beat any man on, on the bowling lanes, and she always had the highest level of professionalism. Here on Pearl Street in Worcester, Massachusetts, the birthplace of candlepin bowling, well, no doubt much has changed, but some things have not. In fact, the appeal, challenge, and charm the game's creator, Justin White, envisioned some 120 years ago, well, to this very day, those things endure. In Worcester, Massachusetts, the birthplace of candlepin bowling, I'm Jamie Keneally.
Thank you, Jamie. And one footnote to that story, the Perella family. Bob's father, Emilio, actually was the man that developed a way to put color into bowling balls. Not just your basic black anymore. It's been over a decade since Candlepin Bowling's been on a major Boston television station. Of course, all of us at the WB are thrilled to bring this lost treasure back to the airwaves. Channel 5 had the longest running show. It ran for 38 years, started back in 1958. Jim Britt was the original host, and I think we all remember Don Gillis as well. Mike Moore is standing by now with a man that worked on that broadcast. They're going to share a few memories. Send it down to Mike. Mike? Thank you, Frank. I'm with a guy who probably a lot of people are going to recognize. 30 years on television, you're a Hall of Fame bowler, also a former commentator on one of the Candlepin shows. Don Riley, great to have you here today. You must be very excited, as we all are, that Candlepin Bowling is back on Boston TV. Thrilled is a, the correct word. It's a venue that we, has been missed by so many, and it's one that will be welcome in everybody's home again. It's a great, great sport, and I'm glad that you're doing what you're doing with it. The, uh, the show is on, of course, Channel 5 for many years. You were the contest coordinator. You were also a competitor. You worked with some of the greats, Don Gillis. You must have a memory or two from the good old days. Oh, uh, certainly. There, well, there was Stacia Zernike winning 18 weeks in a row. She was everybody's favorite, the grand dam of Candlepin Bowling. Then there was uh, Ed Zernike, her son, getting 197 string with 11 marks. There was Paul Burgess' spectac spectacular 500. I remember that one. That was probably the most outstanding moment. And then there was Tommy Olster winning and doing so many wonderful things with the live shows and 22 weeks in a row sure. and 92 over, uh, overall appearances. All right, you retired from Candlepin Bowling. You worked for the U.S. Postal Service in Gloucester High School. But a couple years ago, you had the ultimate honor in Candlepin Bowling in that you were inducted into the Hall of Fame. What's it like when you get that call, you find out you're going in? Uh, it's a validation and uh, the thrill of a lifetime for all that you put into the sport and the recognition that you get out of it. But it brings back all the memories of everything that brought you from day one to that point. Now, that was 2002 for you. I'd like to go back to 1987 for an induction ceremony that I was at, which featured some of the greats of the game. Stacia Zernike was there, inducted Don Gillis into a service, and, of course, Tommy Olsen, who you just mentioned, got the President's Cup. Right. That was a wonderful night, and those people... Don Gillis was the ambassador of Candlepin Bowling. He was welcomed into everybody's living room on Saturday afternoons for over 30 years, and Stacia, she just... She set all the records and all the standards, and people will probably aspire to breaking her records for some time to come. And Tommy Ulster is arguably one of the best, if not the best, Candleton bowler to ever hold the ball. One last question, Don. You're in the Hall of Fame, but it was a 30-year route to get there. You began as actually a, almost a child prodigy on, on television and bowling back 30 years before you even made it to the Hall of Fame. Uh, but you did something that no other kid ever did on television uh, for bowling. Yeah, I was lucky enough to get three strikes in a row. Two of them were really good, and the last one was a quarter hit. I still haven't lived that down. Isn't that funny? You remember the one that wasn't that great. <laughs> yeah. And thank you so much for not only sharing your career, but some great history as well. Thank you for remembering me. I appreciate it. And back to you, Frank. Thanks, Mike. Another name synonymous with Candlepin Bowling, of course, is Bob Gamir. Bob hosted the highly rated Candlepins for Cash during the 70s and 80s, had a good eight-year run, and I recently caught up with Bob in our WB56 studio. What was the magic of your show? How come Candlepins for Cash was just such a, a monster hit back in the 70s? First of all, bowling was a big sport in New England, but it was also a game show, and it was a people show. We put your average person on. It wasn't a superstar show. We would bring the next seven people you would see on the street on the show every night, Plus the fact that people at home had something to look forward to from night to night because if the jackpot wasn't hit, the jackpot grew. And now it's the same principle with the lottery. And I bet there's not a week that doesn't go by where someone sees you in a grocery store and says, Hey, Bob Gamere, kettle pins for cash. Well, yeah, we had 14,000 people bowl. And to the people that bowled, it was very important. How many times is the average person on television? You never forget it. So for them, it was a big deal. But I would see 14,000 people. But I, I, I have an answer. I say, yeah, you won $9, which was the average. And I hit it a lot. And I say, oh, <laughs> you remember me. How about your fondest memory? What do you remember most about the show? Fondest memory? There were so many of them. It's, well, it's... Throw a few at us. Well, the people got nervous behind the door, and one threw up and then came out. And uh, that <laughs> wasn't very comfortable for me. We had a lot of fun on the show. One guy threw the ball backwards into the crowd. Oh, geez. Another guy threw it in the air down the lane because his hands were sweaty. Another guy fell on the stomach. 
we had a lot happen. You had some different rules. You had a red pin. Tell us what, what was the red pin? What you got doubled if you knocked over the lucky pin. It was the lucky red pin. And we had a lot of fun with that, too. Oh. And it would come down in a different spot every time. So the pin setters would go up, and obviously if the lucky pin came down in the head pin spot, for a normal bowler, that's good.